Hello, everyone. Welcome to the stream. We are excited to be with you here today on, what is this, April 12th, um, 2023. My name is Matthew. I am one of the instructors for our online classes, and I help run things behind the scenes here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let Chris welcome you, and I'll give uh, an overview of the process, and then we'll get started with questions. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, welcome everyone to another uh, Q&A session for the online astronomy classes, where, however you find them on Coursera or Udemy, um, or just found this incidentally and weren't on any of our online courses, welcome anyway, and we'll be taking questions on any topic in astronomy, but I'm going to start with a plug because just yesterday uh, my 10th book was published by MIT Press, Worlds Without End. Uh, on exoplanets. You know that's an exciting subject, so I'm very pleased and proud that that happened. And uh, now we can get to the main event. That's awesome. Chris, I'm just going to do a mic check. If uh, Can you just make sure your mic is um, connected to your shirt? Yeah, um, it's, on, just sound it's in the normal place. Uh, okay, sound check, sound check. Okay. Um, all right. Sounds good. Well, let's get going. Um, thank you, everybody. So the way this works is you post your questions in the chat. Then you, um, well, I will grab the questions from there. Please ask your questions only once. Um, and uh, we try to keep this at a beginner level. And we'll be um, able to accommodate everybody. So uh, without further ado, my mouse will start moving again. There we go. We will grab the very first question who, uh, that is from William. Uh, do you think the Big Bang theory is still solid or are there any problems with it or significant competing theories? So the Big Bang theory is quite old at this point. I mean, the basic ideas emerged in the 1940s and 50s. The first evidence for the Big Bang is from really from the microwave background in 64. So it's been around for half a century. And it's still a very strong theory. The idea that the universe had a hot, dense, early state is, is really hard to refute. And there's a lot of evidence pointing to it. When people talk about problems with the Big Bang Theory, they're really talking about places where the theory is pushed to the limit, such as in the explain, explaining the origin itself, the singularity. That is a problem for the theory. Or accounting for what caused the Big Bang, which is also beyond the theory. Um, so some of those issues definitely are there as issues, but they're not fundamental to describing the universe and how it behaves over 14 billion years. So I think the Big Bang Theory is in pretty good shape. Excellent. Thank you very much. The next question is from Jim, um, who would like to know, um, if my ship, if I'm in a ship traveling at 0.4 times the speed of light, so not quite half the speed of light, and I project a, a light in the direction of travel, what happens to the properties of light? So the bizarre uh, consequence of the theory of relativity, Einstein's special theory of relativity, is that light is always received and emitted at the same speed, 300,000 kilometers per second in a vacuum. And so if you were moving in a spaceship traveling at 40% of the speed of light and shone a flashlight or any light beam ahead of you, the people who received it who were maybe stationary with respect to your spaceship uh, would receive it at the speed of light. It wouldn't be the speed of light times 1.4, as you might imagine. Uh, and that's the strange math of special relativity. So when what that implies, of course, if the speed of light is a constant, then time and space must be supple since velocity is distance divided by time. And so both things can happen. Time can dilate or slow down when you travel at a significant fraction of the speed of light, and space itself is compressed in the direction of travel. So for someone on a spaceship traveling at 40% of the speed of light, both of those effects would be operating. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a. Black would like to know, so I'm with this lie, would like to know, how fast do you think the space industry can grow? Will more people be able to go into space in the next decades or to travel, or to travel or maybe even to live there? So the space industries, the commercial space industry in particular, is in a, is in a very interesting state, actually kind of a delicate state. Uh, there's been a lot of growth and expansion, and obviously the two major 
private space companies, the uh, SpaceX, which gets most of the publicity, and Blue Origins, which has almost equal rocket capability, um, are, are launching rockets successfully, uh, and they're trying to grow. The trouble is the revenue streams are not there yet. SpaceX has really only survived, both companies have survived because each of their billionaire founders have been in, uh, converting a billion plus dollars of their stock uh, into capital to throw into the company. Uh, SpaceX has done better on this score because it's had multi-billion dollar contracts from NASA to supply the International Space Station and send astronauts there uh, at a time when America couldn't get astronauts into Earth orbit. Jeff Bezos doesn't really have a revenue stream. Both are hoping to make money from tourism and recreation in space, but those revenue streams don't exist. So the next five years will really be critical for both those companies and all the others that are doing private space, uh, because that will be the time when the costs hopefully will come down, so you don't have to be super rich to do this, and they will finally learn whether there's really a market for recreation or tourism in space, because we don't know that there is. It's an article of faith, if you like, on, the, on this industry that it, there will be substantial numbers of people willing to go, willing to take some risks, and willing to pay substantial money to do that. The next question is from Rajat, who would like to know, um, can you talk a little bit about the current state of and future research in astrobiology from your perspective? So astrobiology is at an interesting stage of its development. Uh, astrobiology is a mature subject of astronomy. It's interdisciplinary, involves biologists, chemists, planetary scientists, atmospheric scientists, astronomers, of course. Uh, and it's devoted to the understanding and study of life in the universe. Well, we still only know one place with life, so the, the key for astrobiology, which has been criticized in the past for us as being a subject without a subject matter, is to find that first instance of life beyond Earth. And that may happen in the next five to 10 years. It's unclear when and exactly how it'll happen, but the capabilities are being developed to potentially see microbial life altering the atmospheres of Earth-like or super-Earth planets, exoplanets. So those are the experiments that people hope to do. James Webb Space Telescope has done some pioneering observations just in its first few months. Um, and so astrobiology is on the brink of a very major discovery, maybe the scientific discovery of the century, but it hasn't happened yet, and those observations are very difficult, very challenging, and even the interpretation of the observations is not going to be as clear-cut as people might hope. So we'll just have to be patient and see what happens in the next five years or so. Uh, the next question is from Ragnar Lodbrok, who asks, if black holes can exist as binaries like stars, can they also exist as trinaries or quaternaries? Yes, in principle, it's possible. Um, so most stars are not single stars in the general and in the universe. Most stars are in binary or multiple systems. So it is uh, possible, of course, to have more, more than two black holes. We know black hole binaries exist because LIGO has been detecting binary black hole mergers uh, for five years, six years now. Um, and yes, it could be possible to have three or four massive stars all die and leave behind black holes in a bound system. But the odds go down substantially because only massive stars can be black holes. So the odds of one black hole in a binary system are significant. The odds of two black holes in a binary system go down to probably a percent. And then three or four black holes, you're talking about a very small fraction of star systems that way. So while they might, uh, they probably exist, there's very, not going to be very large numbers of them, and the nearest examples could be quite far away in the galaxy. The next question is from Piano and Art Autodidact, who's on with us live, who asks, uh, can you please explain the difference between causation and correlation? It's an important distinction in the theory of science and how science works, or epistemology. Um, Correlation is something that you just see in data. So correlation is an attribute of data where you have two quantities or parameters or measurements, and you plot or graph one against the other, and you see a correlation. You see a relationship. It could be a linear relationship or a nonlinear relationship, but it's some form of relationship. In other words, it's not a scatter plot. So that's a correlation, and that can be measured statistically. 
The correlation itself tells you nothing, though, because the two things correlating may actually be unrelated to each other. It may just be coincidence they're correlated, or they could be correlated through a third variable or something you didn't measure. So correlation itself is, is, a, is a tricky thing to prove. You have to do it statistically. And it's also a tricky thing to interpret because you don't know that the two variables that are correlated are the fundamental variables in the situation. Causation is a much higher bar because causation implies you actually have a physical mechanism or a theory or some framework for understanding why something causes something to happen. If you do have that theory or that mechanism, then you can explain a correlation quite nicely. But to go from a correlation to a causation implies a lot of work because you actually have to do have the context of a theory or an explanation for the phenomenon. So it's quite easy to find correlations in science, and it's much harder to demonstrate causation. Well, thank you very much. The next question is from Ben Bohr, who asks, is there a theoretical maximum mass for a supermassive black hole? And if so, why? There is a loose theoretical maximum for a supermassive black hole. So it's a good question, because we found black holes in the center of all galaxies. The scale, the mass of the black holes, scales very roughly with the mass of old stars in the galaxy. So the most massive black holes we would expect to find in giant elliptical galaxies, and that's the case. So the M87 black hole, which has been in the front page of newspapers when it was imaged with the Event Horizon Telescope, is about 6 billion times the mass of the sun. The biggest claimed black hole so far is about 20 billion times the mass of the sun. And since the correlation of black hole mass and galaxy mass is fairly good, then we know what the most massive galaxies are, and so we expect that to be essentially the most massive black hole. So it would be very surprising if there were black holes much more than 10 or 20 billion times the mass of the sun. Next question is from Steve Callender. Um, Professor, if multiple universes were the source of dark energy, is it possible to calculate, based on the strength of dark energy, the mass of the other universes? And might they be similar to ours? So I think the question alludes to a potential explanation for dark energy, which is the, the force, the repulsive force that's causing space-time to accelerate in its expansion. One, one potential theory for dark energy involves hidden dimensions, or brains, membranes. Um, and so the dark energy sort of is a manifestation of these hidden dimensions. Um, there is no current observational test or way to test whether dark energy actually is caused by hidden dimensions, and we don't really have a good physical theory for how those hidden, hidden dimensions might work. And, and so this is very much a speculative field of science, and it's not possible at the moment to say more than that. Adrian Murray would like to know um, if the atmosphere of Mars uh, was made of sort of normal, ordinary um, chemicals, you know, oxygen, hydrogen, argon, nitrogen, um, would it be possible to sort of reinstate it or reinflate it with heavier isotopes? Would that be helpful? Um, that would it help those elements be held captive more by gravity and not? be blown off or fly off into space? So Mars's atmosphere is very thin, 1% of the Earth's atmospheric pressure, and it's almost purely carbon dioxide. Uh, and there are very few other trace ingredients in the Martian atmosphere. Because of Mars' weak gravity compared to the Earth, only heavy uh, molecules, gaseous molecules, can stay and not be leaked off into space. So we could only anticipate, and even if we seeded Mars with other gases, they would have to be heavy gases. Um, nitrogen and oxygen could survive in a Martian atmosphere, but they would leak off into space. Carbon dioxide is a heavier molecule, of course, so it's the molecules that massive or more massive that are most likely to be retained. Uh, so any alteration of Mars' atmosphere is going to run into a, a, an immediate roadblock based on the weak gravity, because it's just simple thermal physics that causes molecules to move faster than the escape velocity in the random motion, and that means they will leak off into space if they're too light. Oh, the next question is from Wendy Traver. 
um, who would like to know, uh, astronomers at Caltech said that they found a theater theoretical reason for Planet Nine to exist. Uh, what exactly does this mean? Well, there are theories of how the solar system formed that certainly include the possibility of something we might call Planet Nine, which is a you know is a, a substantial planet larger than Pluto as yet undiscovered and perhaps in a hidden part of the solar system, either a very distant part or hypothetically with less likelihood on the opposite side of the sun to the earth. So essentially we can't see it in the sun's glare. Um, so the idea of how the solar system formed and what was originally there is, is very much up for debate because you just have to form a simulation and try and reproduce the solar system. But you change the initial conditions slightly and the thing changes a lot. For instance, you can form a hypothetical solar system with more than the eight planets we know of right now, but sometimes the extra planets just get ejected over time. So it's not clear that a planet nine, even if it existed, would be stable long term. Uh, so I don't think theory or simulation provide a very strong expectation for planet nine to exist, and observations haven't yet detected it. Excellent, thank you. Um, the next question from um, one of our live viewers, um, how practical are Stirling engines for space exploration? Stirling engine is a, is a clever thermodynamic concept for, for an extremely efficient, thermodynamically efficient engine. Um, but it's not efficient enough, while it's very efficient in conventional terms, it's not efficient enough in release of energy terms to be helpful for space travel. Uh, for space travel, we have to go beyond current uh, thermal and chemical energy means to something more like nuclear energy, and that would mean fusion or fission power. Uh, each of those energy sources is many orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude more efficient, say, than a Stirling engine. So I don't think Stirling engine is the answer, say, to interstellar travel or even to travel fast through the solar system. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, David Gold, or sorry, uh, Rajat would like to know, um, can you talk a little bit about any of the latest developments in extremophile research? So extremophiles are the forms of microbial life on Earth that can tolerate ex physical extremes of various kinds, either extremes of heat, extremes of pressure, uh, extreme aridity, so very small amounts of water, uh, extreme uh, acidity or base concentration, so a pH that's extreme. So all the various possibilities for extreme physical and chemical conditions. And current extremophile research, it moves fairly slowly because actually it's a niche subject. There, there are not many microbiologists, and you have to be a microbiologist essentially to study extremophiles, uh, who are doing active field work. Um, and so the, the rate of progress is actually quite slow because of the small number of microbiologists doing it. Some are working in the lab only. And, and only uh, a modest number, maybe a few dozen worldwide at the cutting edge, are doing field work. So I'd say extremophile research has, has not progressed dramatically in the last five or ten years. I read the occasional article every maybe year or so, something interesting, but it hasn't really moved the needle that much. We still know of many microbial species that can tolerate very low amounts of water, very high amounts of radiation, can tolerate below freezing temperature and above boiling point temperatures of water. And those, uh, the Guinness Book of Records, if you like, for extremophiles has not really changed a lot in the last decade. The next question is um, from one of our live participants. Um, what makes some people believe that the universe and its regularity, as well as the Earth and life on it, all came by chance? Can science prove to us that all of this came by chance? It's a good question, and then the answer is no. It's very hard to prove that things came by chance, but you have a sort of dichotomy of explanations. Either um, things that we see around us, including the way the universe behaves and the earth and life on it, all arose by unguided forces of nature, physics, chemistry, and eventually biology, uh, or they were guided. And so that's, a, that's an interesting situation because in an unguided situation, then chance, serendipity, random processes are really quite important. Um, however, if it's guided, then you're talking about teleology, you're talking about divine intervention, you're talking about a more religious interpretation for how things are, and that's very 
very much at odds with standard natural scientific explanations. So scientists very strongly tend to be in the camp of chance, serendipity, and unguided uh, forces of nature producing what we see around us. Uh, the next question is from uh, Ravi, who sent an email. Um, in the very distant future, there will be no more energy, matter, or time. Even size doesn't matter when there is nothing to measure or measure against. Um, at least superficially, this resembles a singularity. Could this be a springboard for the next universe? Well, it's true that the far future of the universe involves a sort of heat death on all scales, so it's a dissipative uh, victory for the second law of thermodynamics, if you like. And, and it's certainly possible that out of that context, the sort of accelerating expansion of space-time, the disintegration of normal matter, the evaporation of black holes and uh, stars from galaxies, planets from star systems, um, leads to a kind of a uniformity. That's not necessarily a basis for a new universe. That's sort of the dissipative end of the universe we live in. Uh, but given that our universe emerged what we think of as from what we think of as the vacuum, uh, and then the universe in the future is going to be a pretty perfect vacuum, then it's entirely plausible that another seed or another event will spawn a new space time with something interesting happening in it. So that's just speculation. There's nothing particular about the thermal death of our universe that implies the birth of any new universe. Michael, who's on with us live, would like to know, if you had a blank check for NASA, which program or programs would you give it to and why? Good question. Uh, blank check, and it would have to be a multi-billion dollar blank check because the interesting missions are pretty expensive. I would be wanting to head to the outer solar system, and I would be really interested in going beyond what the uh, Europa Ice Clipper, the sort of ESA mission that's been approved to launch in a couple of years and get there at the end of the decade. It's only going to do uh, a flyby and a deep ma and a mapping and perhaps a splash off experiment. If I had that blank check, I would go, go to Europa, which is a water world, which has an ocean under ice, which is completely plausibly a place where life could have evolved. And I would figure out a way to melt down through the ice pack and release uh, a life detection submarine. And the technologies to do so exist. So it would be expensive, it would take a while, but it would be a compelling experiment. Uh, Manjitha would like to know, could it be true um, that another universe was created opposite to our universe with the Big Bang process and that it works as a parallel universe to our own? I mean, the idea of a parallel universe is not ruled out by current astrophysics. Uh, I don't know that we can really think of something being a mirror image of our universe or a direct uh, replica of our universe. The multiverse theory, which acknowledges that the creation of the universe could have been a quantum event, if inflationary theory is correct, will certainly allow the possibility of other creation events, other universes spawned from quantum level fluctuations in space-time. Uh, it's, however, likely that those other universes in a multiverse theory have radically different properties than our universe because they will be random sampling alternative and different laws of physics. Um, so it's actually very unlikely to have a twin of our universe formed from this process. So in uh, thematically, um, I'll jump ahead to this question from Sanchita Ghosh who asks, um, if multiverse theory is proved right, then would we be living in all the universes simultaneously with the same sets of friends and relatives and family? I think the answer is no. I think if the multiverse theory is correct, then there's a diversity of space times and universes, uh, not all of which have to be large and long-lived and almost the empty as our universe is. They will be universes that sample many possible parameters. So in that sense, uh, if they're randomly sampling physical parameters and even laws of physics, the odds that you'll have a direct replica of anything that happened in this universe uh, from the initial conditions are extremely low. So I suppose in the end, if the multiverse theory is not bounded and the number of parallel universes is extremely large number, potentially infinite, then logically, yes, at that point you will somewhere some when have a clone or a near clone of our universe. 
but that's really pushing the multiverse theory, I would say, past the breaking point. Lawrence K. asks, uh, has the rate of expansion of the universe been measured or clarified by JWST, or is this controversy still in the literature? The issues of the Hubble expansion and the Hubble tension is what this subject is called. It's a tension between the current expansion rate of the universe measured by the Hubble Space Telescope and its key project and successors to its key project um, from local measurements of galaxies. Uh, is, is it odds? slightly with the expansion rate inferred at a much lar a much earlier epoch from measurements of the microwave background and distant objects. That tension, it's, which has existed at sort of two or three sigma levels, so it seems to be significant, it's not going away, uh, is, is unresolved at the moment. And so there's plenty of people debating it. Um, James Webb is not going to weigh in on this subject because James Webb was never designed to do distant measurements, say by supernovae, the way Hubble was, and it doesn't have any other tools at its disposal to measure distances in the universe. And it's not measuring microwaves, which is how you learned about the early universe. So on this subject, uh, as opposed to many that James Webb will contribute for and to, uh, James Webb Telescope will be mute. Um, the next question is from an email from Irene Kitzman, who asks, what are the implications of massive galaxies found by JWST to be in the early universe? So first of all, hi to Irene, my neighbor and good friend, um, and great amateur astronomer, I might note. Uh, the early massive galaxy formation that James Webb has found is, is fascinating. It's not necessarily a deal breaker for cosmology um, because we still don't have really excellent ideas of how galaxies form. Um, we know they form fairly early. James Webb is pushing the boundary of early galaxy formation back to maybe 50 or 100 million years after the Big Bang. But if, for example, you form seed black holes early, uh, maybe 100 to 1,000 times the mass of the sun, you can nucleate dwarf galaxies that grow quite quickly and then fuel those black holes. So you can have scenarios where with seed black holes you grow galaxies in their central black holes pretty rapidly and after a few hundred, couple of hundred million years you can get a big beefy galaxy. Also James Webb is of course, uh, you know, there's a selection effect where the James Webb is most able to detect the brightest and most massive galaxies at any epoch. So it will find those galaxies first and it may turn out that those galaxies the most massive galaxies of that epoch are actually quite rare, and the majority of galaxies are much smaller. And so in a, in a sort of spectrum of fluctuations uh, and initial conditions, you're always allowed a few outliers. And so maybe James Webb is finding the outliers now, and it's not saying anything about the underlying distribution yet. Uh, Manjitha, who's on with us live, would like to know, if we fall into a black hole, will the processes of the mind stop along with uh, a change in time? I mean, it's a great question and we don't know the answer. So if we fall into a black hole that's of modest mass, like a dead star black hole, then the tidal forces that, that will essentially rip us apart um, before we enter the black hole, they will, they will apply as you approach the event horizon. They will, of course, destroy our brains and, and consciousness as we know it. So in the hypothetical of falling into a massive black hole where tidal forces do not kill us or rip apart our, our bodies, then the question of what happens to the mind and the brain and consciousness is a real question. And, and it simply doesn't have an answer. Um, it's possible that inside the event horizon, the state of matter or the pressures or the stresses or the other forces or radiation environment is so uh, bizarre and alien and damaging that, that humans cannot survive, that there's no consciousness and then essentially you do die inside a black hole. But the truth is we don't know because we can't really describe the physical situation inside the event horizon very well at all and certainly not in any detail. Uh, the next question is from <clears throat> an email. Can you talk about why population three stars are so huge? Uh, is it related to their proximity in time to the Big Bang? Um, it's a couple of reasons. So population three stars, first of all, are, as the name astronomers use for um, 
the stars that form in the first wave of the universe. The pop in the historical jargon of astronomy, population one and two stars are the conventional stars in most galaxies. Uh, population one stars are the older ones. Population two stars are the younger ones, like the sun. Population three is a separate designation for stars that form early in the universe, in the first wave, perhaps even preceding galaxies. And the theory because we haven't really observed population three stars definitively, the theory says that they will be massive. And that's for a couple of reasons. It's for the first reason that the universe, of course, was very dense. So we're probably talking about a redshift of 20 or 25. And th that means the, uh, the size of the universe, you can basically take one plus z. So the universe was 20 times smaller than it is now, which means it was 20 times hotter, and it was 20 cubed. Uh, times denser, so thousands of times denser. And in that denser universe, you can nucleate uh, and grow a star and collapse a star very quickly that's 200, maybe 300 times the mass of the sun. So that's the main reason. Secondary reason is the fact that there are no heavy elements uh, in the universe then because they haven't been formed. The stars haven't fo been formed uh, to eject heavy elements, and so is hydrogen and helium. And in a simulation, when hydrogen and helium, a pure uh, environment with no heavy elements or metals, as we call them, um, then the star actually collapses very quickly and can grow very much to a rapid size, to a large size. So we do anticipate very massive population three stars. Uh, John V, who's on with us li live, would like to know, uh, is there a speed of dark? Is it the same as the speed of light? Well, the speed of dark, I suppose, would be the speed of dark matter. Um, and dark matter is hypothetically a subatomic particle. Um, it's hypothetically a particle that arises out of supersymmetry theories, perhaps the most stable uh, particle, the, f the, the heaviest stable particle that arrives from these supersymmetry theories. And so that particle will not travel at the speed of light. Um, we do believe that dark matter has to be cold in astrophysical terms as opposed to hot dark matter. Hot dark matter means dark matter that moves at close to the speed of light, like a neutrino. Uh, we think cold matter has to be dark to give the structure we see in the universe, and so dark matter is subrelativistic. So the speed of dark is almost certainly much slower than the speed of light. Uh, William Buglin, <clears throat> um, is on with us live. Um, the question is, research indicates the Sombrero galaxy is spherical, elliptical, both, and neither. Can you talk about which one it is and what's the difference between the different kinds of galaxies? Well, Sombrero, as the name implies, does have an obvious spiral shape, but it also has a, a, sphero a spheroidal distribution. And, you know, the classic galaxies that have spheroidal distributions are elliptical galaxies, and they have no disks. Um, and there are extreme or late type spiral galaxies that have almost pure disk and a very small spheroidal component or nuclear bulge component. So the Sombrero galaxy is in a regime where it has a substantial disk, a dusty disk, you can see the dust lanes, uh, but it also has a huge spheroid. So it sort of has the elements of both of the fundamental types of galaxies, spirals and ellipticals. Maria asks, can you talk about the JUICE mission and outer system, outer solar system possibilities for life. So the JUICE mission is a rebranding of a mission that's been hypothesized or proposed over the last decade or so. It's a Jupiter icy moons mission, basically. And it's a, uh, it was originally conceived of by NASA, but NASA's budget was not gonna allow it. So it sort of pivoted to be mostly a European mission from the European Space Agency, but there is American participation, international participation, actually. Um, so it's the icy probes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go to the icy moons of Jupiter, and those are, of course, the Galilean moons. Um, and it's going to uh, survey them as well as it can in sort of the way that Cassini uh, did in the Saturn system by doing looping uh, clever orbits that take it close to many of the, of the satellites of Saturn. In this case, it's Jupiter's moons. And the icy moon, of course, that's most notable is Europa, but also Ganymede, which is the largest of Jupiter's moons, has almost certainly got a subsurface ocean. So it's going to look particularly at Europa and Ganymede, and then have uh, more cursory looks at several of the other jo Jovian moons. 
Lee Bergen asks, do the objects near the edge of the universe still exist, or is it only the light or radiation reaching us? Well, that's a good question because, of course, the light travel time is, is substantial. So when we uh, look towards the edge of the horizon, our horizon or the edge of the visible universe, we're seeing objects that could be 30, 35 billion light years away and where the light has taken uh, 12, 13 billion years, maybe even 14 billion years to reach us. So we're seeing them as they were 14 billion years ago. And then the question is, what are they like now? And we, of course, can't see what they're like now. We have to, we're stuck with the old light and we just have to wait to see how they change. But it is true that a galaxy seen uh, 14 billion years ago could have evolved a lot in 14 billion years. It's unlikely to have uh, you know, gone away entirely, but a galaxy, for example, that had star formation could have completely used up its gas and faded from view and become a very low surface brightness object, very hard to see after 14 billion years. Uh, a galaxy could have merged with other galaxies and become transformed, say, into an elliptical galaxy. Uh, it might have been disrupted by tidal interactions and sort of been ripped apart. That's less likely, but also possible. So very much the case that the things we see at the edge of our horizon uh, might be unrecognizably different if we could see them right now. The next question is from Adwaith, who's on with us live. Uh, what do you think are the most promising avenues for discovering evidence of extraterrestrial life, and how might this impact our understanding of the universe? Well, the detection of life beyond Earth would be a profound discovery, the scientific discovery of the century, I would say. Uh, it's possibly going to happen in the solar system, but that's a more challenging thing. We're stashing Mars samples right now. The Pers uh, Perseverance rover is stashing samples to bring back to the Earth around the end of the decade, maybe early in the 2030s. And it's possible there will be fossilized microbial life found in some of those rocks. Um, on the same time scale, or maybe quicker, we'll probably be able to sniff out the atmospheres of Earth-like uh, planets far away, exoplanets and to look for atmospheres, atmospheres altered by biology with ingredients like oxygen or ozone or methane and water vapor, of course. Um, and those experiments are, we've done prototypes of those experiments. James Webb has done a couple of prototypes, but not with Earth-like planets. And the big ground-based telescopes that are being constructed, three of them now, um, will all be able to do that experiment. So those are the two ways that life on Earth is likely to be first found. There's no guarantee it will be found, however. It's possible that uh, Mars never really did host life uh, or that the evidence we bring back will not be good enough to measure it or not. And it's also probable that the first data on exoplanets will be very hard to interpret uh, and very hard to prove that we found something or even to rule out that there's nothing there. The next question is from Rhea. Can you please give a beginner explanation for space-time and what space-time is? So space-time is a theoretical construct uh, developed by Albert Einstein in his theory of gravity called general relativity. Um, space and time in Newton's theory of gravity were completely distinct entities. They were both flat, uh, infinite, and completely separate from each other. They were unrelated in physics. In Einstein's theory, they are related, and so we have the hyphenated thing called space-time. And what that means is that the properties of space uh, affect time and the way it flows within that space. And the properties of space are driven by mass and energy. In Einstein's theory, mass and energy curve space and time. So, uh, and that's the bizarre part of the theory, that mass and energy will curve space in the sense of causing light to be deflected as it passes near a massive object, but they will also cause clocks to slow down in stronger gravity. So time is bent, if you like, by uh, mass as well. And since the two quantities are linked, you have to calculate them together. You can't calculate the effects of mass and energy on space alone or time alone. You have to calculate, in the theory, the effect on both together. Um, that's thematically uh, close to another question from Faisal, um, so I'll bump it up. Um, and they'd like to know, can black holes have an effect 
on the gravitational waves heading towards them, for example, by dispersing them or absorbing them or doing something to them? Um, that's an interesting question. So uh, gravitational waves passing through the universe from other gravitational events or cataclysms, such as a supernova or emerging black holes, the kind we've seen with LIGO, um, if they were to pass near or by a black hole, uh, they would indeed be influenced, and they would indeed be focused, scattered, um, not reflected, uh, and partially also absorbed by the black hole. So it is true that black holes influence gravitational waves that pass by them or near them, uh, but it's a very subtle effect. And of course, black holes are very rare objects in the universe, so most gravitational waves are unlikely to have ever encountered a black hole as they pass through the universe. Uh, David P., who sent an email, says silicon shares many properties with carbon, carbon being the basis of life on planet Earth for the past four billion years. Could silicon be the basis of uh, life on other planets? And if so, could it develop into an intelligent life form that communicates uh, with other planetary civilizations? And if it's unlikely, why? So the, the speculation about silicon-based life is is rooted in the fact that silicon is in the same column of the periodic table, so it's a similar electron, electron structure in its outer shell. And that means silicon is, also, is able, like carbon, to bond. However, chemists will tell you, and there's a research literature on this, that while silicon can form quite complex and varied molecules, those molecules do not have the diversity nor the stability of carbon molecules, which is organic chemistry. And so from a chemistry standpoint, uh, silicon is possibly a basis for biochemistry and biology, but it's not nearly as good a basis as carbon. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So it's definitely not impossible, it's just that it's not as good. And so, you know, in, in nature, I suppose the best thing or the easiest thing happens first, and the thing that's hardest or doesn't work as well is rarely going to be found. So that's not to say we could rule out finding silicon-based life elsewhere. Uh, it's just less likely, it's less stable, and therefore I think it's less likely to be persistent long enough to develop complexity and intelligence and technology. So there's possibly some very primitive forms of silicon life in the universe, but very unlikely that there are advanced forms of silicon life. Well, the next question is from Edwaith. Can you explain the evidence for dark matter and how it affects our understanding of the universe's structure and evolution? So the evidence for dark matter began in the 1970s uh, from the measurement of the rotation of spiral galaxies, including our own. Uh, the rotation speeds of the stars were so rapid in the outer parts that they couldn't be explained by the visible matter in the galaxy. And so a model, a picture emerged over a couple of decades that the visible parts of galaxies were somehow, and the visible matter that composes stars and gas and dust, um, was embedded in a large and massive halo of dark matter, invisible stuff, that outweighed the normal stuff by a factor of six or seven. And that model hasn't changed. That's still the best evidence we have for dark matter, still from the rotation of spiral galaxies or from the speed of stars moving in elliptical galaxies, because dark matter exists around all galaxies, not just spirals. Um, we've since cemented the evidence for dark matter with gravitational lensing, because matter bends light, and normal matter and dark matter both bend light. So we've weighed dark matter in various scales and in various cosmic situations, and shown that dark matter pervades the universe. It's not just the halos of galaxies. So the evidence for dark matter has just got stronger over time. And it's a context for the formation of galaxies, because of course, galaxies form with a, uh, a, a, an ascensus of stuff that is 80 to 85 percent dark matter and only 10 or 15 percent normal matter. So if you're trying to figure out how a galaxy forms and what structures you would see in the universe, you have to include the dark matter. So even though we don't know what it is, you have to put it into an astrophysics simulation to generate formation of structure the way we actually see in the universe around us. The next question is from Jean-Pierre from Lebanon. Uh, my question is, with the AI industry growing fast nowadays, is there any project or might there be for an AI civilization, quotes, colonizing the moon or any planet? Well, AI is a 
course, already helping many science fields. Astronomers use AI and machine learning to do their discovery, to map out galaxies, to optimize simulations and their understanding of things. So machine learning and AI is now very much a tool of the, of the modern scientist, and astronomy is no exception of that. Uh, as for whether AI could eventually feature in our ability to live off Earth, I think it probably could because these are going to be very difficult environments and sort of understanding how to live in those environments will be challenging uh, because of the variables and the danger and the hazards. Uh, so I think a precursor to humans living off Earth would be robots and AI entities living off Earth and figuring out how to do it well. And, they, and, and AI does learn rapidly based on its experience and its mistakes and successes. So yes, I think it's quite plausible that AI will be in the vanguard of our efforts to live off Earth. Uh, Alejandro Padilla uh, mm -hmm. is on with us live. Would we be able to see nebulosity and color in deep space if we were to travel that far? The deep sky images we see from Hubble, JWST, et cetera, are colorful, but those colors are invisible to us, if I remember correctly. Well, it depends on the images. There's so many images now on the internet, and, and many of them do not have true colors. Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope project, as a, as a project level decision, decided to have a sur substantial subset of its images, the Hubble Heritage Collection, for example, if you go online, uh, are, are trying to do true colors. So they're trying to represent colors as they actually would be. Um, and so they're not altering them, they're not amping them up, they're not um, you know, making them lurid or using a strange color table. They're, they're representing colors as the sensitivity curve of the eye with wavelength would reflect. And so if you were out in deep space, uh, in principle, the nebulae and the colors of the galaxies and the colors of planets you saw somewhere else would reflect those colors. So they are, they are legitimate colors. Now that assumes your eye is operating normally. Uh, the sensitivity of our eye depends on its environment too. Um, so if you were on another planet with a different, slightly different atmosphere or a different pressure situation, your eye would actually function differently. Uh, obviously in deep space you, you can't survive in a vacuum, so there's no way to see in a vacuum. But if the physical conditions were different, the eye would actually operate differently. And so things might look a little different from we, what we see in these images. Uh, JP ha is on with us live. NASA, uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center director swore in with Carl Sagan's pale, pale blue dot instead of another book. Um, it made my heart swell. So my question is, what's your favorite book or work by Carl Sagan? Yes, uh, NASA has a new, um, uh, NASA's Goddard Space Center has a new director and she's a young, uh, fairly young actually to be a director of a NASA center astronomer and so I, I don't know her very well but I know of her and that was a very interesting choice of hers. Uh, Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot is, is one of my favorites too um, and if I were going to swear in on a book I'm not quite sure what I would. I might take a more unusual choice though. I might swear in on Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, one of my personal favorites. It's a very British answer, I feel yes. like. <laughs> um, the next question is from uh, Michael. Uh, Sci-fi assumes that we will discover how to travel faster than light. What does the human race look like if we never figure it out? Well, science fiction does have, as a trope, I would say, uh, faster than light travel. I mean, it's there in Star Trek, it's there in Star Wars, it's there in almost all the sort of standard science fiction franchises and in many of the books of literature going back decades. Uh, it's against the laws of physics though, and so as far as we know, physics, if it's complete at that level, will prohibit us from faster than light travel. It will, worse than that, it will actually make near light speed or 10 or 20 percent of light speed or more uh, impossible for large physical objects because of the energy requirements. So the future of humanity in that regard means it's a little constrained. Humanity is unlikely to develop the capability to travel through substantial chunks of the galaxy, ever, if that's the case, with the big exception 
that if we develop the ability for suspended animation to put humans on ice essentially and, and put them in a, a weight state where they could s survive that way for hundreds or thousands of years to be reanimated at a distant location, then humans could gradually percolate out through the galaxy in, in much slower starships where the humans just are essentially inert until they get to the destination. So that's the way we would have to do it if we wanted to expand through a significant part of the galaxy. Uh, Joseph uh, Maranzano asks, what is the probability of a runway, runaway greenhouse situation on Earth that would resemble what happened on Venus and it would destroy all life on Earth? Well, this is obviously a, a pressing problem. It's a, you know, it's a planetary science uh, research project to try and understand how Venus got the way it did, and it's fairly certain that Venus's toxic, uh, oppressive atmosphere and surface temperature, almost hot enough to melt lead, came from a runaway greenhouse effect possibly two to three billion years ago. Because Venus is otherwise an almost twin of the Earth, almost the same gravity, obviously hotter because it's nearer the sun, but it's only 30% nearer the sun. So it's an object lesson in what happens if the greenhouse effect does run away. And the jury is out, basically, on how much warmer the Earth would have to get for that to happen. We've added about a third, 30% uh, more carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere in the last 50 or 60 years. And I think if we add about that much again, then we will be past what climate scientists call the tipping point, which is to say that the temperature will continue to rise almost regardless of our efforts. So that's a very sobering reality. Now the models that say at what point you reach the tipping point and at what point you have a truly runaway greenhouse effect that you, you can't intervene with, um, that's very unclear. Models will say different things. And of course, if you had sufficient energy and initiative and, uh, and tools at your disposal, you could probably claw back a runaway greenhouse effect in its early stages anyway, but it would be vastly more expensive and difficult than just stopping it happening in the first place. Akshata asks, um, what would happen if a, or I guess it's a kind of a hypothetical situation, um, if a gas giant had all of its gas layers swept away with only the rocky core remaining, would this kind of planet be habitable for life? It's an interesting question. So gas giants, uh, we think, are in the outer parts of their solar systems, as our gas giants are. But let's just take our gas giants as the example. Because we can't see to the cores, we are using uh, indirect measurements, magnetometers from orbiting spacecraft and, uh, and, and sort of indirect probes of the interiors to infer that all the gas giants have rocky cores. But when you read the research literature, the range of masses claimed for the rocky cores is highly variable. So for something like Jupiter, the mass range I've seen goes from 3 or 5 times the Earth's mass to 10 or 20 times the Earth's mass. But we imagine there will be rocky cores. So at the very least, these rocky cores, for even Uranus and Neptune, are likely to be super-Earths. They're definitely going to be more massive than Earth-like planets. So if those gas layers were stripped away, you would have a super-Earth. And the super-Earth would have enough mass, of course, to hold a slender atmosphere, just as the Earth and Venus do. do. Um, so we imagine there would be an atmosphere of dense gases around the super earths But this would be very far from the sun. The gas giants are all billions of miles away from the sun. And so these would be unlikely to be habitable planets, although they would have enough interior heating to have active cores and, and plate tectonics. Um, so it's really unclear whether they would be habitable, but it looks like they wouldn't be. Uh, Georgia Paget would like to know, does radiation emit from inside a black hole? We think not. The, black, the event horizon is, a, you know, in the, among the things we do know about black holes, the event horizon is an information membrane, which is to say nothing can get out. And that includes all information. Information is radiation, particles, matter of any kind. So um, whatever is happening inside the event horizon, if whether there's, there's obviously mass in there, but whether there's radiation in there or whatever's going on in there, uh, we will never find out about it as far as we can tell. Uh, Rajat, oh, um, let's see. So uh, Rajat posted a question um, saying that 
Uh, I basically would like to know if uh, other versions of your book are available um, since books are sometimes expensive to buy in India. Are there electronic versions? Are they, do you know if, if those are available or will be available um, at some time in the future? Yeah, so it's a hardcover because it just came out a day ago. I mean, if it's successful in about a year, there'll be a paperback, and that's a lot cheaper than a hardcover, maybe 40% of the cost of a hardcover. And I think there's an audiobook plan. So at the moment, currently, at the release date, no, there's just the hardcover, which I agree is close to $30, so it's not cheap. Um, but if you wait about a year, there probably will be other options. Excellent. I don't know if there is a library system available, but um, in the United States, if you can talk to your librarian, sometimes they will put requests from the community on the list, and they will purchase a copy, and then everybody in your community can read it. Right. Um, so uh, P51, uh, who is Chris, asks, um, um, can you talk about how gravity is influenced by, um, let's see, oh, by the expansion, oh, excuse, let me, sorry, let me start over. Um, can you talk about how um, the great attractor works? And uh, can you talk about uh, whether that kind of idea of a great attractor that was around in the 80s and 90s, early 90s, is still around, if we've discovered whether there still is a great attractor, or if other phenomena like this exist in the universe. So the great attractor was a, um, a structure, a very large gravitational structure, so just essentially a large, very large number of galaxies, tens of thousands in one very big region of space, several hundred light years across. And it was detected through uh, velocity and distance measurements from surveys uh, that are now 20 or 30 years old. And it was coined as a great attractor because, of course, it has a sufficient mass that we uh, and our local galaxies and even the entire Virgo cluster that we're falling into, we're falling into the great attractor. Um, it was also hypothesized that this structure was so large that it was a challenge to gravity theories of how the structure in the universe fall evolved and maybe was a problem for those theories. That issue has sort of gone away because it's turned out with de more detailed observations, with better surveys, with denser sampling of the galaxies, that the great attractor is not quite as massive as it was claimed originally. And so its mass is not a problem for formations of structure and how they form. It still does have an influence on the Milky Way, so that part hasn't gone away. Um, it was just an early example of how surveys of galaxy redshifts could lead you to identify enormous structures in the universe. And we found superclusters. There are hundreds of superclusters in the universe, and some of them have enormous masses and sizes rivaling or exceeding the great attractor. Um, and it is now 11 o'clock. We uh, will take one final question from Maria Nemo, who asks, um, what uh, there are some circular sand dunes that have been found on Mars. Do you have any idea of hypotheses as to what could cause such circular features? Uh, could they be artifacts of windstorms or are there other hypotheses? I think when you see a circular feature in a sandy terrain on Mars, um, th there are, I suppose, two possible hypotheses. Obviously, you could have a sort of enormous dust devil type configuration that would swirl the dust and create a circular pattern. Th that, on the scale of this feature that I'm understanding is unlikely because the atmosphere of Mars is so thin that the, the dust devils exist. We've seen them. Some of the rovers have got videos of them. Um, they tend to be small. They tend to be smaller even than the ones you might see on, in the desert here on the Earth. Um, so the dust devil scenario doesn't seem to explain them. The other way they can arise is by a sort of indirect uh, indication of volcanism. So you can have volcanic pits uh, which are essentially sort of uh, calderas or underground or uh, places underground where the lava evacuated uh, a sphere and the sphere collapsed and so you ended up with a, a sort of hole and the hole is gradually filled in by dust and matter over a large amount of time and then you're left with the rim outlined by this, this ring on sand. So that's the, the other way that it could arise, by sort of being an indirect reflection of a volcanic feature underground. So that was an interesting one to end with. We covered a lot of ground, as usual, multiverse to Mars. And uh, thanks to Matthew for facilitating, and thank you all for participating. 
Um, I, I don't think we're on a two-week cadence for the next one because I'm going to be in the Czech Republic in two weeks. So, but I think we do have one on the schedule, and we'll just announce when the one after that is because it's going to be sort of second week in May, I think. Um, so we do have one scheduled for, um, I believe. Yeah. So we do have one, I think, scheduled for two weeks from now, but it's on a different day. It's not on a Wednesday. Okay. It's either on a Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember. It's but it's it's in the email that I sent okay. out. Okay. So look at the announcement because we we are moving the days around for these live sessions to accommodate my travel. Right. Exactly. And Vicky, that'll be on Twitch, and Vicky will be facilitating that one because I will also be out of town um, for that one. Um, I hope you all had a good time today. We always enjoy your questions and spending some time with you and uh, getting to think about some really fun aspects of astronomy. Um, have a great rest of your day and take care, everyone.